folks. Long time no talk. Matt McQueen, Mix Mind is podcast. It's November 12, 2017. Roughly six more weeks to the end of this year. We'll be writing 2018 in the ledgers before you know it. And I don't know how long we'll be writing 2017. It always takes me about three months to get caught up. God, 2018. Wow. Unbelievable. Yesterday, November 11th, Veterans Day, but for our family, it's Liam's Day. My son Liam turned three years old. Three years ago, that baby, I was going to say little, but he wasn't little. He was very big. Nine pounds, two ounces. He was a chunk. He was one big baby. He came out a week after his due date. We had to actually go in there and uh, and uh, get him out of there. We were able to schedule it, which was kind of interesting. I think the emergency aspect of flying down the highways to the hospital would have been interesting, but in our plan, uh, in our way of life, my wife and I plan a lot. We even got to plan that. We got to plan when we went in, we got our food that we were going to have that night, and we actually spent the night in the hospital. We went in on the 9th of November, and our son was born around 2 a.m. or so on the 11th, so we were there for quite some time before he decided to uh, to come on out. And we were surprised by him in the sense that we did not want to know what sex our baby was leading up to it. I actually did. I'm more of somebody who wants to know. The surprise was nice, but it didn't overcome. Um, it didn't overwhelm my initial request or want to know, but my wife didn't want to know. So I will go along with that. So I was extremely surprised when a boy came out and I remember when the actual birth was happening, not to get graphic, that the doctor said, oh my gosh, look at that tuft of red hair. He came out with a full head of red hair, which he comes equipped because of my wife's father who had red hair and my wife's brother who also has red hair. So our little guy turned three yesterday and that's not why I haven't done a podcast in some time. I was looking back over and I actually released my most recent episode titled Pimp about my project management professional certification process. I released that three weeks ago yesterday. Three weeks. I usually do these things every weekend. That's kind of my indicator. If I get to a weekend, I got to do a podcast. I want to keep pumping them out. I had uh, happened to do four of them over that final week before I had my hiatus here. But um, the reason I haven't come to you, come to your ears, come to your audible sensibilities, is uh, there's a very there's a very good and sad reason for that. My wife and I were in the early stages of pregnancy. We were in the early stages of having our second child. It was again going to be a child that we did not know the sex of. And in most cases, I think it's too early to know anyway. But uh, in my wife and I's case, we use IVF, in vitro fertilization. For Liam, we used IVF. And for this second baby, we were using IVF. And I think we will obviously always use it. Um, We went through a very intense process when you do this. You go through a few things before you ultimately end up at IVF. I think, um, what is it, IUI? There's a few different. uh, There's a few different steps on the way to get to full IVF, which is where the embryo is actually created almost in a test tube, if you will. That's why they ended up calling these test tube babies when this initially came to the fore and to society. It really is an amazing thing, and I will say that now, when you go through this process. You're amazed at the amount of other people who are going through this process too. When you go to these waiting rooms for monitoring, um, it's a highly cared for process. I mean, you're creating life here and there's doctor's offices that are promising life to couples who might have some issues. We did not necessarily have issues. Um, I guess we sort of did, but uh, my wife has MS as anyone who listens to this knows and You can try to go naturally, but for some people who don't get pregnant immediately the natural way, it can go some time before it happens. And when you go through the process of getting pregnant, for someone with MS, they cannot continue to take the medicines that help. They're called disease-modifying drugs. 
And these drugs basically help stave off the effects for the most part of MS. And you take them religiously, regularly, either daily, several times a week. Uh, There are some that are infusions where you actually go to an infusion center, much like someone would go for a cancer uh, radiation. Uh, You go and you you get infused with uh, a compound for one hour. And you only have to do that monthly, but you have to actually go somewhere and go through that process and kind of rearrange a day once a month to go do that. And you're sitting around a lot of people who are going through cancer treatment, which is not the happiest of moments and events to be in the presence of. Um, But when you try to have a baby, you have to be off those medicines because you don't want a lot of these medicines to make their way to a forming being. And then once you actually get pregnant, there is some mechanism. uh, I don't know if my wife quite felt this with uh, Liam, our first pregnancy, but there's a mechanism whereby for, uh, I guess, some significant amount of the population who has MS, where having uh, a, a baby in utero being pregnant staves off many of the symptoms of MS. Maybe it's nature's way of being kind to what is an amazingly difficult process to anybody who's been through it. If you're a female or even the significant other male uh, or significant other, whatever the sexual orientation is, everyone goes through this and you go through it as as an observer, but as a very uh, participatory observer. And it is an intense process, nine months, three quarters of a year, It's an amazing process, and what happens at the other end changes you forever. But because of this, my wife uh, can't really – you can't really allow the natural process of things to go on for way too long because the longer you go on, the more you're you're off of the medicine and the more you can have a flare-up, and when you have a flare-up in MS, that can cause a lot of damage in between the times where things are quiet. So it's sort of a – it, it, it's sort of a, uh, not a game, but it, it's a process you have to account for the whole way. And so when things naturally didn't work uh, as quick as they might have to work, we ended up going into the process uh, of reproductive uh, assistance, if you will. And we did go through all the steps and then ended up at IVF. And it is an amazing process. And it's one that you tell few people about, but it's very all encompassing. And you're at doctor's offices continually. You go through many procedures to, um, to retrieve eggs, to, um, to fertilize embryos, to do all this. And what we actually did was uh, around the time of our son, Liam, uh, well, when he was just an embryo, we pulled all of the eggs we're going to use, fertilize them. And we've actually done what's called banking. So you almost keep these embryos stored I was thinking to myself, imagine the insurance that the uh, reproductive medicine or medicinal facility has to pay (laughs) to to keep that place insured, where there are all these embryos, all the hopes of people's um, expectations for children in the future, ready to go on ice, if you will. And so we bank them. And I'm always amazed at the fact that all these ones we banked would would, uh, basically be uh, fraternal twins, right? They were all pulled at the same time. They were all fertilized at the same time. And then it's just a matter of the quality of the embryo that, uh, determines who's up first. So our son Liam was the highest quality of all of them, but the majority of the embryos we have stored are all very high quality. It's just very slight gradations that is different between them, but quite a process. And the one thing I always say to those who I do tell about this The IVF process is amazing in that you can watch conception. You can watch um, in the first process when you are quote unquote impregnated, you go to a facility and they literally come in like scientists with the embryo in this big machine, maybe an incubator, if you will, but it, you know, at the highest levels, it's like science class and they have the microscopes and the microscopes have the embryo on the screen there and you're seeing everything and it's overwhelming and they have music that almost sounds like cold play. You're kind of tearing about all of the process that's happening before you. So in the IVF process, you get to see it happen. You get to see that embryo get placed in the uterus. I mean, not to be, uh, you know, not to be too graphic again, but it's a pretty amazing process. And because you do that, and then because you're followed by the 
reproductive associates for the first nine weeks of that pregnancy, you are, uh, you are given access to something that I think people who have babies in the conventional, I don't want to say normal, but in the conventional way, they don't quite have that access. So we got to see conception. We go to monitorings. Well, Melanie had to go this time because we have our son, Liam. I have to be with him. For Liam, uh, when he was in utero, I got to go to all these. You're going weekly, sometimes twice weekly, and you're seeing the embryo grow. You're hearing heartbeats. You're doing all this. So you have a lot of accessibility to this growing child eventually uh, that many people maybe don't. And so you go through that process for nine weeks. And uh, at the end of the chain, you end up with a child just like anybody else. There was just some assistance to get you there. So we decided, um, uh, we always talk about it, but we kind of decided that uh, come the turn of the new school year, we were going to look at uh, going for child number two. The tough part with this going through the IVF process is that You literally have to make the cold, hard decision. Okay, let's do it. I know people can make the cold, hard decision. Okay, let's try. And you have the serendipity of it happening, or you have the, um, the slight bad feeling of it not happening initially, but you know, you're going for it. And there's a slight chance or whatever the chance is of your, uh, fecundity, if that's the word. Uh, whatever the chance is, you could have it now, you could have it in a couple months. There's a serendipity though. For us, we literally decide, okay, this is the time you, you do all the preparation for it. There's a lot of shots. I mean, I feel very badly in that sense of how much I had to inject my wife with this progesterone, which helps kind of create the most perfect, suitable environment for a baby. So nature takes care of these things, but when you do it through this process, you have to up the ante to the major leagues. You have to make sure that that environment is as perfect, as optimal as you possibly can. And that comes down to taking a lot of things. It comes down to daily injections, which I end up having to do as the significant other. And most nights it goes fine. Some nights you get bad reactions um, and it actually starts to play on your mental uh, your mental capacity there where you're kind of sitting there going, Oh my gosh, I have to do this. Oh, uh, and then it goes, it goes right one night, then goes badly the next night. And you don't really know what you did differently. Not much. And you're hitting areas that are getting hit nightly. And it's just, it's very tough to have to do that to a loved one, but it's a necessity of this process. It's a necessity of going into this, um, this means of pregnancy. And it worked, it worked for Liam and we knew nothing different. And then we went in for baby number two. Again, we did not want to know the sex. We, in, in uh, quotations, my wife, but I'm going along with that. I was okay with that. I want a healthy baby. And we set it up in such a way that we were going to um, have the baby around the beginning of June. You can actually kind of plan that in a way because you can plan when they're going to um, when they're going to put the embryo in place and then through logical math of nine months, you can end up around the beginning of June, which is Melanie's birthday, June 2nd. We were actually looking at a June 3rd birth. And the thing we liked about this was we could be optimal with the schedule. Melanie as a teacher would be getting July and August as all teachers pretty much do, at least in our area. I know there's some places around the country where they have different schedules for different reasons, weather, agriculture, whatever it is. Um, and so we were going to be optimally set up where you would, uh, not have, you'd basically have those two months and then you can use certain days and then certain, uh, maternity leave days into the next year where maybe with Liam, when we had him in November, she was at about three months. You could parlay it with a baby that's born that close to the summer to maybe being out five consecutive months. And it's important to us because Melanie is our health insurance as the teacher, as the state employee, she gets a very good health insurance plan. And so we use that, but you run up against some, uh, some restrictions where if you start pushing it beyond a third month, you now have to go to Cobra. So you're now paying for your health insurance out of pocket and, uh, it's not the most optimal situation. Plus you don't have her income to, uh, so it's a double whammy where you're not getting the money in and then you're putting a lot more money out for a benefit that you have otherwise. So there was a lot of considerations that had to go into that with our son, Liam. 
With this one, we were looking at a great uh, situation where we could really work around that. Our son would be potentially around four at that time. Nice spread. Uh, my brother has a child who's two and then a baby. Um, well, his, uh, his daughter was born around the time, his newest daughter was born around the time that uh, his older daughter was two. So that's, that's some intense, uh, that's some, in, that's some intense time between the two. It's, it's very tough and you can see they do very well with it, but it's a struggle. It's hard. There's no way to have little kids like that. You don't have any of your own time. Uh, you don't get much sleep. It's tough. It's a tough gauntlet. So we're looking at a four year difference and it would be something that, uh, that would be real interesting to work with. So, um, we go in, we have this happen we go through the first nine weeks of this pregnancy. Everything's great. All indicators are great. We hear it's a big baby. We have the heartbeat, which is always something that's touching when you hear that heart beating, sustained by the mother. And everything was good. And then what happens is when you use uh, a reproductive uh, doctor to help with that process, they see you for the first nine weeks, basically until you have a fully viable pregnancy in many ways. And then you get moved off to your normal OBGYN. So we got through these nine weeks. Everything was great. Really good reports. Everything is trending and tracking the right way. And uh, we had it set up where we were going to go to our OBGYN appointment, which was about a week and a half after our last appointment with the reproductive doctors. And then on Halloween, we were going to be coming home early because it's trick or treating. Our son, Liam, again, who just turned three yesterday was going to be Daniel Tiger. Daniel Tiger was the theme of his birthday party. He loves it. Anyone who doesn't know Daniel Tiger, it's sort of the new Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers apparently had these hand puppets and Daniel Tiger was one of them. And so they turned this animated series uh, over to these these puppets and characters. And so it's a cartoon, which is very much Daniel Ty, or sorry, very much Mr. Rogers, but it's these characters kind of living out uh, the Mr. Rogers lessons. It's a very good show. My son loves it so much. And he was going to be Daniel Tiger on Halloween as well. So I was set to kind of sneak out of work to get home for trick or treating. And my wife called me and she was completely hyperventilating and she was completely, um, fit to be tied, very upset, very upset. Um, she had told me that she was just, it almost felt like she was peeing her pants, if you will. There's going to be some things I have to say here that might be kind of graphic. I'm going to try not to, but it's very important for me to move forward with my show to tell this because I live this and it's in me. And if I don't get it out, I don't think I can go on talking about a lot of the normal things I do because it's just uh, it's something that I just, that, that I felt so intensely the reason I've been gone for these three weeks and, uh, I don't want to bury it. And so she told me she was bleeding. Um, and usually when you hear something like that, you think the worst because you think to yourself, how does that happen? Because, you know, you, you kind of grow up learning that, uh, the first indicator that you're pregnant is that a woman misses her, her period, right? So you're thinking to yourself, well, if, if that's the indicator you're pregnant, then if that happens in a pregnancy, it must be really bad. And I, I always think optimistically. I never really think the worst. I've had a real good life of great things that have happened to me. I haven't even lost extremely close people to me yet. I know it's going to happen in life, but I'm very optimistic. It's just in my nature. And I've stayed optimistic even through what I'm going to tell you here. So she tells me this and then she says, I'll call you right back. And so I kind of get ready to go to the car. I don't know what to do. And she calls me back. She said she called the reproductive medical associates and they said to go right to an emergency room. Then she called the OBGYN who we had not even had our first intake appointment with this pregnancy with yet. And they said, go to Chilton because that's where their practice, uh, that's where the hospital that their practice serves out of is. That's where our son Liam was born as well. And so she said, all right, my mom is going to come pick me up, meet me at Chilton. Chilton is 
ostensibly halfway between Newark and uh, our home in Sparta in a convoluted way, but it's essentially halfway. And so I, dro- I drove there. She, she had her mom pick her up. She went there. And I'll tell you, driving there, I, I always want to keep my mind... I always want to keep my mind above the fray of bad thought. And it was hard here. You know, you're driving in your car. It's one of those flashbulb memories moments where you're worried something could change for good. And I'm trying to listen to a podcast or Howard Stern or something. And I think I was actually listening to Howard Stern. I'm very behind on my Howard Stern episodes. So I think it was the one where they were talking with Richard Christie, one of the members of the show, who was going to be having his baby around Halloween. And so it was one of those moments where you're like, oh my gosh, I, I, I don't think I could be hearing this right now. Why is this coming at me right now? Because you're hearing someone at that final stage, you're hearing someone go through that excitement of, of what's to come. And I'm sitting here headed to the hospital, worried about what I'm going to find out, uh, worried about my wife, worried about a future child. And uh, miscarriage is not something that is talked about very often by people. It's a very private, um, sad, personal um, thing you go through. And so a lot of people don't just volunteer it. And I know my mom had one when uh, uh, between my brother Mike and then my brother Tom, which were about seven years apart. I always wondered why they were so apart. She had one. Um, but it's not something you just, you don't hear it. It's not like people just talk about it. Just like people don't really talk going to IVF or just like people don't talk about a pregnancy until it's, you know, until it quote unquote sticks or it's at that safe zone where you can sort of tell people because the personal aspect of it is so intense and the, 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 the kind of the, there's a karmic feeling like a third sense, like you don't want to tell too many people because if it goes wrong, you're going to have to untell people and, to untell is as sad as the thing happening because people might come at you and you might have told them and then that's the first thing they might say for good reason they should say that and then you just have to go oh i'm sorry we you know th- we lost it here or there so i'm just thinking about these things and i'm headed to this hospital the same hospital around the same time of year where i had where our son Liam came with us came home with us was born to the world Uh, when we were there around that same time of year, I'm headed to this hospital to the emergency room for something that I I just wasn't expecting. No one's ever expecting this, but I was just the way our first pregnancy went, there was real, no issues. And the way you go through IVF, you kind of, you screen the embryos in such a way that the embryo itself won't, wouldn't cause a, a pregnancy loss. So you're really not prepared for this, especially when you get to the nine week to the 10 week point. You're sort of not prepared for this. And so it catches you as a shock. And then the other part of it is I'm just saying to myself, everything's going to be fine. It'll be fine. There was a little of this. There was a, there was some bleeding in our first pregnancy very early on. Not much, um, but it happened. So you maybe you're, you, you're just convincing yourself. You're, you're telling yourself uh, what your mind wants to hear because it's the only thing you can do. You don't want to think the worst because the worst, the worst cuts your insides out. Uh, it, it, it cuts you off at the pass, cuts you off at the knees, all that. And you're just not, you're not prepared for it and you don't want to be prepared for it. You don't want to hear these things. You don't want to be someone on the other side of loss of a viable embryo that was going to grow up to be your second child. And, and, and the one thing I found a lot of people go through this, um, and they get up off the mat and they move forward, but you just don't, you, you, you don't kind of visualize yourself going through it. So you don't even know how to act, but we're on the way. I get there. I get there first. I'm not the kind of person who leads in front, but I go in there and I was there before my wife and I said, can I check my, can I check in now to the emergency room? And I remember saying the words, uh, to the, to the girl at the front desk there, the emergency room, she said, what's it for? And I said, I think it's for a potential, uh, there's, there's a miscarry. There's a miscarriage worry. And then they just got, they got intense. They got straight up. Yes. Give us the info. There's something about that. They're not going to play hard with you. They're going to, they understand there's sort of a compassionate landing spot for that. And so I did that. They got us in real quick. 
And the one thing you learn about a pregnant woman, th- there's almost a, a sanctity of life that spreads itself around wherever you are. When a woman is pregnant, everyone around you kind of tries to make, uh, make the softest place where they can, uh, they, they can land. They, they understand what a woman's going through and they want to make it as comfortable as possible. Move things along. I've never seen an emergency room visit move so quickly. We were in and out in two and a half hours, maybe. And so she, my, my wife is hyperventilating. We're in the hospital. We're in the emergency room. Her mom's there too. And, you know, we kind of have the double whammy of this worry on top of not being home with our son. My mom was at our house. My wife's aunt and grandmother had come up to be around him for Thanksgiving. He's really the only child in the family now. So everyone kind of puts all their love into him. Uh, my cousin or my, uh, my wife's cousin who's been on the show before Jamie, uh, she made her way over. It was nice to see kind of everyone come together to be there for us. Because the intensity of this moment really, it can't be explained. I was getting heart flutters. It was like panic attack central. And when you're someone who doesn't emote, that stuff sticks in you and and is pushed down even harder. So it means it's going to come up even harder. So we go there. uh, We had a moment of truth. They were going to take us to an ultrasound. And we got the ultrasound. We're in the room there. And anyone who's been through an ultrasound, you sort of go through this point where they they show on a screen, you can see the womb, you can see the embryo. And the the woman, the emergency room radiologist was sort of like, oh, that's a big hematoma. That's a big hemorrhage. So that's what was happening when the blood came. There's something in pregnancy called a subchorionic hemorrhage. It's a, it's a typical, for pregnancy, it's a typical, it's, sorry, it's typical to a pregnancy when people have it. It's a subchorionic hemorrhage. It's just, it's the term that's, that's used for it. And so she saw it. She's like, wow. Okay. That's, that's big. But then she turned the sound on and we had a heartbeat. And so I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh. Okay. We were thinking the worst. We're as worried as all hell, but we have a heartbeat. We're going to get through this. We're going to make it. And so I left there, we, we, we moved out of that room and I remember having a little conversation with her mom and saying, you know what, Melanie's schedule is too intense. We got to pull it back as if, as if a hemorrhage has anything to do with the person. It has nothing to do. It's nature. It's happening there. It's happening regardless of whatever you do. When we, when we ended up meeting when all this was over with the reproductive uh, doctor the other day, um, my wife had asked her. Does, uh, was there something I did? And the doctor jokingly said, do you smoke cocaine? <laughs> so I guess there is one way you can make it happen. And she's not, by the way, she snorts it. No, I'm just kidding. That was a, that was a silly joke that we did in the moment, but we got out of there with a heartbeat and we thought we we're going to be okay. And we, f- we left there feeling somewhat okay, shaken, but feeling somewhat okay. We got an appointment with the OBGYN the next day. We had our intake appointment two days later on that Friday that was already pre-scheduled. We felt like we had a plan. We we're going to be okay. My wife is still going through this and it still is just happening in such a way that makes you feel eerily like something is just not right. She's been so sick through the pregnancy too, more so than she was the first time. And she was sick for 16 straight weeks, day and night. She was never not sick with Liam. And it was like this here, but it seemed almost 50% worse. Like there was just something that was almost a sickness you can't shake. But you have a pregnancy, you fight through. I give women so much credit for this. So the next day I leave work early. I meet Melanie at the doctor. We go in, we meet with the doctor. She tells us that the hemorrhage, the blood clot, whatever you will, was five centimeters, which was like, you know, I don't even know. I can't do the math now, but if the baby's 2.8 centimeters at that time, which is so tiny, it's like half a finger, right? The clot was almost twice as big as the baby. So, so this baby has a fight on their hand. They gotta, they gotta, they gotta thrive in this world around this blood clot, which is like an existential crisis. It's like climate change. Sorry, Republicans. Um, it's this thing that's hanging around and, and what you come to learn about these is if they're not near the baby, as was the case with our first son, Liam, it can kind of just be absorbed. It can move its way out. It doesn't affect things. If it's near the baby, 
it can cut off its nutrition, it can cut off its flow, it can be so big that it shears the placenta right off, which is just so scary. But we had a heartbeat, and we're at the doctor, and the doctor did prepare us for everything. She prepared us for all eventualities. Um, She did note that miscarriage can happen, but she had seen pregnancies, plenty of pregnancies go through with bleeding and make their way to the end. Some people bleed all the way through. I know it's gross, but like when you're feeling this, when this is your, it's your blood, right? I mean, it's your, it's your, it's your baby that you want to see to the end. Um, you're not thinking that's the eventuality. You think you're going to be the one that makes it. And again, this clot was like bigger than the baby, much bigger than the baby. So scary. So we go out somewhat optimistic. We're ready for our Friday intake appointment. Melanie continues to be just to feel terrible, terrible cramping, terrible things happening inside. And you don't know what's happening unless you have an ultrasound. That's the problem. So the woman is living this and whatever's happening in there is just causing existential terror, but you don't have your indicator until you see what's happening. And so on that Wednesday appointment, We spoke with the doctor. She told us about the situation we were facing, but we never saw an ultrasound that day. And I wish we did. On Friday, we got there. We're still feeling somewhat optimistic about what's going on. We go to the, we go to the doctor. They end up having the entire intake appointment with us, which included taking, uh, you know, getting blood, a full evaluation, kind of setting the stage for a pregnancy. We don't, we'd heard all the stuff with Liam, but Uh, They told it all again, things you can eat, things you can do when the next appointments are going to be kind of scoping out the, 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 the rest of the, what would that be like 26 weeks, Um, including the due date, June June 3rd, went through all this and we knew we were going to do this ultrasound in the office. The doctor had said she would do it. They typically wouldn't, but she was going to fire it up to give us a peace of mind. So we go through this 45 minute appointment. And then she says, all right, you can, I'll take you to the ultrasound room. The doctor's going to, she's going to give it to you. She'll administer it and we'll see what's what. So you go through this whole appointment and you think to yourself, everything's okay. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. The ultrasound was fired up. All that weird gel, almost the gel that was in the movie Fire in the Sky that the guy woke up in with his hands and that gross stuff. And she turned the lights out, put on the screen, much like we'd seen in that, in that, uh, emergency room radiology facility on Tuesday, much like you see throughout a pregnancy dozens of times, probably. And my wife was laying down. The doctor had turned the monitor. I thought so she could see it. I could see it fully. And I was watching and she put it on there. You saw the typical thing. I saw the baby there in the ultrasound. And when you have these, it always seems like they turn the heartbeat volume up later. So I thought nothing of it. But the doctor was sort of jiggering around the little wand on my wife's stomach a lot. Almost like the type of thing you would do to like spur movement from someone. But then it occurred to me, why would you spur movement on like a three centimeter embryo? I mean, they're not moving. Um, then, Then she turned something on, that thing in a in an ultrasound, she turned it on, which elicits like the kind of the, the color spots, which I guess shows blood flow and all that stuff. And then she turned to my wife. And again, we've watched this whole thing. I'm not thinking anything of this, Uh, nothing. I'm just thinking she has yet to turn the volume on. She turned to my wife and said, so I'm guessing, you know, from the position on her back where my wife was, she raised up with her hands to her face and started to cry as hard as I've ever seen her cry. It was all so surreal. I sat there motionless. I had not felt loss like this in my life, this close to me. I mean, in our lives, are there maybe five people living that would elicit what you would imagine is an emotional outcry? Probably. And so I'd never been tested with that. I cry more from art, from television, from movies than I do from real life. Maybe I want the movies. Maybe I need the music. But I sat there emotionless, numb. 
And I don't know what that says about me, but it's not about me, <laughs> but it was, it was kind of a weird thing to go through. The doctor then put the wand away, turned the machine off and left. She gave us a moment. You just have no idea how you will react in these situations, in these circumstances. Um, and I was just so sad, but so numb. I thought about how much had gone into this, all the daily shots, all the sickness, all that we'd gone through initially with this process four years ago. Those embryos waiting, that embryo waiting for life for four years. And there's no mind to it. It doesn't think. It's just an embryo waiting to be implanted. And it had a heartbeat. The fa- I have video. I, this thing had a heartbeat. And then it's extinguished. It's gone. And so that sadness came to me. But I was, I was just not processing all this. We got the doctor back in there. And she kind of laid out what was happening. But you just, you're, not, you're not processing it. You're not hearing it. This loss is so profound that <clears throat> you don't even know how you're going to just walk up and leave. What do you do next? How do you read a book that day? How do you watch something? It, it, not that any of that even matters, but it was like it was like a meteor. And when a meteor hits the earth, it it makes quite an impact in the ground. And that was where you felt at the bottom of that impact. And so the doctor got back in, I had to go retrieve her and she said, the baby, the embryo, whatever you want to call it, there's euphemism, pregnancy tissue. They try to say almost to make it not feel as bad at that point. She said we would need to have it removed because of its size as well as the size of the hemorrhage. This embryo, which we cultivated with such care, which we had tested, which we had frozen, um, our second child just waiting for its nine months as carefully as that spark of life that we saw on that monitor on that day when this was implanted as, as carefully as it was placed, it would go out just 10 weeks through a DNC DNC stands for dilation and curatage. It's the euphemism for an abortion. We were not having an abortion, but that's what an abortion is. <laughs> It's getting rid of the quote unquote pregnancy tissue. So we would need to get rid of this because it was too big and the life had been extinguished from it. This was a procedure we never countenanced. We never thought possible. We never thought we would be at the hospital for that. Again, at that time of year, just three years to almost three years to the day that our son Liam was born there. I mean, procedures are usually hope hope, you know, procedures usually mean hope, healing, rejuvenation. And this procedure was the polar opposite of that. It was a medical necessity. Yes. Could it hurt my wife somehow? And so you want it fixed for that? Yes. My wife's had some surgeries and you always kind of go into them with a the feeling that you're going to come out on the other end of it, feeling like something was fixed, repaired. Nothing would repair this though. You know, and it's funny, looking back, for some reason, the doctor did not get us into the procedure as soon as truly possible. So this happened on a Friday, 3 p.m. I'll remember it forever that we saw this. I remember, I'll never forget seeing that screen and then being told that the, there was no heartbeat. And the doctor went through what would happen the next few days. I mean, I don't know if it was because they didn't want to work on a weekend. I don't know if it was inconvenient, but they set us up for the procedure the following Tuesday at one o'clock. So this is what Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, like four days after we've had this information and who knows if, um, when this happened, it could have been the day before it could have been the day before that. So we could be five or six days that, you know, this embryo is with you. This, this baby is, is with you. My, my, my wife went home from that procedure, still pregnant, still with the feelings of pregnancy, still with the baby inside of her. It was so, it was just, it was so sad. And I don't know, looking back why we weren't sent to the hospital at that moment 
because it got real bad from there. Um, you know, it, it, it just occurred to me when you have a beating heartbeat, I, I thought back to that Tuesday when we had a live baby, they said to go to that emergency room as fast as you possibly can. When you didn't have one, they set up a procedure for four days later. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if there's some kind of financial consideration that's hidden behind all this. I don't know why. But when it's live, everything matters. When it's not, we can put it off. And I understand sort of why that is. But the mother still has to live with that. And it's just terrible. You trust medical professionals. And they certainly must deal with these, with these miscarriages, much more often than us. If they say you can go home for the weekend and then another full in a day, a full day and a half after that, it must be okay, right? It never felt right. That weekend we had our annual professional pictures taken, one of those places in the mall where you go and you have the scene set up behind your child. We like to get those done around my son Liam's birthday uh, time, kind of those benchmarks of where he is each year, really nicely professionally done pictures. <clears throat> We had some of our family, and I I know it sounds weird, but my wife and I both independently said this to each other, that it was strange to us. I don't know, comforting was the word, but the baby was technically with us in those pictures. We'll always think about that. Um, We both kind of thought that, and it was a weird thing because I think we were both, um, we were both a little hesitant to tell each other. But we moved this appointment up to have these pictures taken because we were going to be able to get an appointment with our reproductive endocrinologist, the IVF doctor. It was going to be the next Friday, and that was the original scheduled date for the pictures. The baby wouldn't be there by then, but we wanted some answers and some reassurances, so we pushed them up, and we we had these pictures taken, but we both thought this. My wife continued to be sick. She continued to go through the terrible feelings of pregnancy, and she probably was going through the drawn-out process of miscarriage. I'd come to learn this, and I'll never forget what doctors did. I'll never forget what they didn't do. They didn't show humanity. I mean, in many ways, through negligence, they showed barbarity. Um, I would tell some people what happened just here and there. Some people, the guys at the coffee shop who I sit with, the fellow dads who waited out at our coffee shop in the morning for an hour before taking on the post-traffic highways. Some work in New York. I work in Newark. Some work in different locations in New Jersey. So I sort of, uh, you know, there's there's not an exact time you say these things, but I had told them we were pregnant. Again, I thought going through our IVF process, maybe I was overconfident. Um... I wasn't seeing this happening. So I told a few people. And so these same people, I would tell what happened. You know, it's such a feeling of loss in the darkness. And at this stage of a pregnancy, few others know. There's family, there's close friends, those you see every day. Maybe a number that could fit on two hands. You want to tell the world, but maybe it's best to bury it. But then you're burying it in yourself. You want, you want the loss of this to be felt. It's partially why I'm saying this on this podcast. It's partially why I asked my wife for the, um, for the allowance to do this. I wanted her blessing to do this. I said, this, this has been too intense. And, you know, when I was telling them, telling different people, one guy said, one guy who has three kids told me he's had three miscarriages. Well, his wife has. And I'm sitting there going, how do you go through that? It's a brutal punch in the gut. It's brutal. You're constantly taken back to the fact that you had a heartbeat and then you don't. You think about this child growing up and being another one of your children and it's gone. And there's not, it's not right or wrong to think that way, but you, when you hear other people have gone through it, it starts to just sort of level you a little bit. You start to feel a kinship with that person a little more than you did before. I mean, it was, uh, it was tough. And I don't know if that, if telling people makes it better, but it at least diffuses it a little bit. It spreads it out there. It allows somebody to come to the fore and tell you their story. Um, and again, no one's better or worse, but sometimes you just need to get this out. And I bury stuff. 
It makes you feel less alone, though. It's proof that there's much more, um, you know, there's a silent shared experience out there, but there's people who have it. And it, just like IVF, just like going through this now, uh, just like the early stages of pregnancy, it's happening and people are living it. And it is an intense process. It's a, it's a solitary in many ways. If you think solitary is a couple, I mean, there is so much that goes into creating these things. It's amazing that so many are born. I mean, it gives you the momentary comfort, but your mind always goes back to that loss. I'm not sure any amount of future children will lessen that feeling. Time always helps, but it's not a cure-all. And you know what? The more I thought about it, maybe it's not, I mean, maybe it's also, maybe it's important to not forget it, but to consume the loss to add its feelings of sadness to your being like a macronutrient. You know, maybe you need to feel this. Maybe it's important. uh, It's an important development to you. Um, And I wish that I wish I could say this was the end of it. On Monday, my wife started feeling extra sick. Something wasn't right. As I said, her body still thinks it's pregnant at this point, at that point. The processes that kick in during the long slog of pregnancy don't go away in a day. We Googled. Some people have sickness stay for weeks, according to the forums, of course. And you shouldn't be on these, but you know you inevitably do. And she was she was down enough from what happened, so it only made it worse. When you have the shared goal of what's happening in pregnancy, you deal with the sickness. When you're feeling sickness for no reason at all when you've lost that pregnancy and you're still feeling it, it's just, it's, it's extra bad. I put her to sleep early on Monday night as I had through much of this shortened pregnancy. I kind of liked that aspect in a pregnancy. I like having those three to four hours by myself, but I went downstairs, did my own things. I fell asleep and woke up on the, woke up on the couch around midnight as I had almost every night. I made my way upstairs, opened my son's door halfway because his room does not get heat. By some quirk of our system, it is the last vent on the single air line. It winds three stories through the floor of the attic and around. Because of this, we closed his door while we were up at night and opened it when we turn in for the night. <clears throat> then at a time I found out it was about 3 a.m. So this is 3 a.m. Tuesday, election day. Phil Murphy won good news, but around 3 a.m. on election day, on a day of rebirth for many people, things started to turn. It was bad. My wife woke me up in excruciating pain. And again, Tuesday's the day we're going in for this procedure, but that wouldn't be at this point for 12 more hours or 10. I don't know. You can't do math at this point. Pain does not affect her, so when she talks about it, it's bad. She called the doctor's overnight line. No one called back. The system said to call back if no one calls in 20 minutes. She waited 25 and did it again. Why have this kind of message system, by the way? Why not call back? Why do you put the onus on on the patient who's in excruciating pain to call back 20 minutes later? What's the point? Why is the onus on the pained patient? I just don't understand. The doctor finally called. He sounded like he was woken up by this. This is a doctor who she'd been going to for 20 years. She told him she'd continued to bleed and that cramping was terrible. It almost sounded to me and felt like labor. The doctor said she was probably passing, quote unquote, pregnancy tissue. An awful euphemism in my book. He said he'd see if they could get her in earlier on Tuesday. So there's some hope here, right? We were scheduled for 1 p.m. and we had to get there by 11.45, but he was going to see if he could get her in. Then she went into the bathroom and she horrifically passed something. In the middle of the night, this was absolutely terrible. It felt like almost reminiscent of that off-used horror story when someone's driving on a dark road in the middle of the night with no one in sight and then they hit someone? Do you keep driving or do you go back and get out and look to see what you hit? 
and I was that person. I didn't want to go and see. I was so sad and she was more sad. This was just, this was something I could never have imagined going through. This was something we were not prepared for. And you're sitting there in the middle of the night. You kind of have that must up feeling about yourself where you're not there. You're halfway there. Our son's in his bedroom. You know, you can't cope. You can't handle this. It's just being woken up from a dead start. She felt some relief. She got some sleep. We woke up. She was still in pain. We received no calls. We thought at least we'd wait until the doctor's office opened at 830 to call and follow up. But I don't know why are we calling to follow up? Systems had let us down here. It didn't make sense to me why we were going through this alone. We dropped my son off at school and we took him to vote on the way. I thought that was important. He walked in and yelled, kids don't vote. (laughs) And everyone loved him. Um, it made the day of all the volunteers. That's not a bad skill to have by 8 a.m. in the morning. Maybe he has political aspirations in his future. We came home after dropping him off at school. The pain came back. I'm telling you, this was labor. How terrible. The doctors were no help. I don't think the doctor even did anything. I don't believe he looked for an earlier slot. We called the receptionist, and by the way, they don't pick their phone up at 8.30 even though they say it's up. The receptionist told us she would text him because he was in an important meeting. I'm not saying there's not important stuff and people need to be able to multitask and do things, but we were, we were in need of help. We were really in a bad place, and they left us there. You know, the on-call doctor at the hospital, who wasn't even the doctor we talked to in the middle of the night, ended up calling us and told Melanie to keep our original appointment. We were being given, we were being given no relief. She said, you could pass everything by the time you are here. Oh, great. I'm thinking to myself. So all this pain for an already, already mentally and physically painful existence. What we, pa- what we found out on Friday in that doctor's office at 3 p.m. is now being compounded over day after day after day, and no one is helping us. We were at the point where there was eight hours of a natural process, which I honestly, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic, I would compare to home birth, which by the way, these doctors hate. They don't want home birth. They don't. They want people to come to the hospital. But the minute it's not a live baby, hey, you do what you want. Eight hours of this for what could have been a 15 or 20 minute procedure under sedation. Unacceptable. I've never felt so useless. We were somehow forced into what felt like a home birth. This was like even for someone like me who can handle some things, I couldn't handle this. I tried my best. I turned inward. It was really awful. You know, the medical community, they love to talk badly about home birth. And I'm not for home birth. I'll be honest. I love a sterile hospital. I love having professionals in there to do uh, what they need to do and to help you get through this. I'll never forget how intense that process was going through one birth with our son Liam and how much you need those professionals. And here we were, we had no one, we were home. Luckily our son wasn't home. But, you know, again, when you have what is thought to be a live baby in the womb, they will move mountains to get you to the hospital. But when there's no longer a heartbeat, it feels like doing this process at home is okay to them. And in a home birth, you have a midwife at least. I decided at 10 a.m., it's time to just go. I said, fuck it. And I'm not an aggressive person, but this was like, I felt hopeless. My wife was in so much pain. And I said, they can find a way to deal with this. I went to jump in the shower and then Melanie screamed from the other side of the house, from the guest room, bathroom. Looking for relief, she had tried to go take a bath in there. It's the only bath we have in our house because our, our master bathroom has a really nice shower. I ran across the house and saw her sitting alone in the bathroom. She was seated atop the toilet with blood on her hands. I'm not trying to be graphic here, but I will never forget this. She said she got up to get in the bath and felt something coming, and she caught something. We can say euphemistically, pregnancy tissue, clots, whatever. 
something passed. And I don't know that we would know the difference. But again, with the sanctity through this process, we treated these embryos to go out this way was horrifying. We live in the suburbs in one of the safest towns in New Jersey. We are not in a war zone witnessing atrocities, becoming a nerd to death and destruction. But for our frame of reference as suburbanite New Jerseyans, this was horrific. This was barbaric. If this happened out of nowhere in the middle of the night, a live pregnancy that went bad while we were sleeping, I would have some understanding. Of course, if that happened, we'd be accepted into an emergency room immediately. But this all happened with days of planning. Something that started exactly a week earlier, the worst case scenario confirmed four days earlier, and here we were living this. We don't live in the middle of a rural state 100 miles from the nearest hospital, understanding the bargain we made in a med- medical emergency. We live in population density between major cities with hospitals and doctors dotting the nearby landscape. It's unacceptable. We live probably within 30 to 40 minutes of three hospitals, including the one that they could have had us in. And then if you spread it to another hour, there's probably five or six more hospitals. And here we are at home. It was awful. This is why I feel like I have to talk this through. And I'm so sorry if I've turned people off with this. But the sadness we felt through this process, on its own what happened was awful. But then to go through the follow-on day after day after day, getting worse and worse and going deeper into just places we never thought imaginable. Unnecessary trauma is what I kept calling it. Even just one day earlier for the procedure and we would have never experienced this. This trauma that we will both never ever forget. This experience which could affect your plans for children which will certainly affect how you treat any future pregnancies. I would not think my wife is crazy for never wanting to have another child again, which is disgusting that the medical community, that this group, this group who has a history with her, they put her in this position. They put us in this position to experience trauma, unnecessary trauma for something that is supposed to be a joyous occasion. When we left for the procedure, there wasn't much there, according to the doctor. When it was all over, we got in the car and drove home. Only a few days and three years removed from making the same drive at the same time with our then newborn Liam, born yesterday, three years ago. It was snowing on that ride. And of course, there was mixed precipitation on this one. As you do, when you come up off the mat, you try to be resilient. We were hungry, so we did what my my wife and I usually do. We found a place to share a sandwich. Quick check. Why are there so many goddamn quick checks now? It's not even the best place. And uh, we got some food. We got some water. Some chips. And we set our way home. And, you know... When you go through something like this, and this is why I think it was important to talk about, because when you go through something like this, it really is a a silent pain. And I think it's important to talk about because you, you bury it. You walk into your day, step after step, day after day, holding this, and you need to get it out. I went to the chiropractor two days ago. It had been about a month. I go monthly. And... The chiropractor was aware of our pregnancy. It's funny who you have to tell, you know, people who you would think are close friends. You don't tell a chiropractor you tell because it functionally could affect you in the case. My wife goes there. That's why it would. So she has to tell the uh, chiropractor because maybe there's certain things, modalities, stimul, uh, electro stim you can't do to pregnant. You know, there's some things you got to you got to modify for someone who's pregnant. So this chiropractor was aware and I had to walk in there. And I had to tell her what happened. I wanted her 
I wanted to be the one to tell her so my wife wouldn't necessarily have to tell her when she was back in there. But I had the most the most tightness I've ever felt in my back. I've talked about back pain, right? And I just did an episode a little bit ago about how back pain is the manifestation of things going on in your life of really that it's not really pain. It's just where all the pain and all of the things you're going through and the stress where they kind of uh, hold court. And so I have had a tightness in my back that I cannot shake. It almost feels like my back is broken and maybe it's my heart broken, but it felt like it was broken. And I went to the chiropractor. It was scary how bad it was. And she was pushing on it. And she said, thank you for telling me what happened because this, she goes, this is awful. It makes a lot of sense. So when I talk about the fact I don't emote, you know what? We all feel it all comes at us where it finds its, where it finds its place that it manifests is up to you. Do you let it out? Do you get it out? Do you speak it out? Or do you let it sit somewhere? Do you let it sit at the most vulnerable parts of your body? The places that a turned ankle, a balky back, a knee, an elbow, a neck. You ever notice how how, how pain, even existential pain, finds its place there, buries itself there? Well, it happened. And so I got confirmation on that pain. She said, you might want to come in in two weeks instead of four. So this is where I am. This is where three weeks have gone without a podcast. And I felt it was important to do this to be able to move forward. I thank you so much for listening. Everybody who listens just means so much. And I hope anybody who's gone through this finds comfort or not comfort, but finds maybe solidarity maybe finds that they're not alone because this was uh, this was something I was living in real time that I will never forget. And I blame humans. I blame medicine. And my wife and I went back to our reproductive endocrinologist, as I said, and it was nice to even talk to her. And she said what happened after that initial prognosis that we got on that Friday no heartbeat. She said everything that happened after that was unacceptable. As much as a doctor can say that in this time of malpractice, got to be careful. But we'll find someone new. We'll find somebody who could give us the service we demand. And we're not demanding much. We just, we just asked to not go through that. And we went through it. And my wife and I will be closer for it, but I didn't need to be closer to her for that. We didn't need that. And, uh, Make sure you have the right doctors. Friends, thanks so much. I will talk to you later.